Various topics were discussed during this week's two-hour-long Active Transportation and Sustainability Committee meeting. Andy Palin, the Executive Director of Living Barry, presented 10 actions that people can take to address climate change. There was also an update about the September 17 Bike the Night event. It is a 30-minute guided bike ride that will start at Meridian Place at 7 p.m. But a topic that dominated the meeting was the relevancy of the committee itself. Committee member Kelly Patterson McGrath pointed out that in the last four years, the council did not act on most of the committee's recommendations. Members also raised the issue of not having a budget to undertake any activities. Yeah, we need money to make things happen, guys. You know, we can't, we can't just... Councillor Keenan Alwyn blamed Barry's low tax approach for a funding crunch. City Council over the past, you know, couple of decades has taken a low tax approach. And so, you know, staff are competing for resources and um, are doing a lot of these things off the side of their desk. And so um, it, it's hard to keep up with all the recommendations from these committees when we ask for a new report and just because they're struggling to keep up with the basic uh, operating services at, for, for our residents. And Councillor Anne-Marie Kangal recommended solutions to address these problems. Follow the timestamps in the description below to navigate to the relevant section of the meeting. There is also a link in the description to the article about the meeting. All right, good. All right, so I know uh, I know also you probably have heard a version of this before, but there's a few new members here that uh, I don't know if uh, you've had the introduction to Living Green and what we're trying to do. And uh, so I thought this would be a really good opportunity to um, to introduce you at what we're doing. So who we are right now is we are Barry's only registered environmental charity and we've been operating for over 30 years. Basically, if there's been a green initiative in this area in the past three decades, we likely started it or part or part of it in some way. We started Spring into Clean. We built the first community garden. We even started the city's uh, first plastic recycling program before the blue box kicked in. Uh, right now, we have two part-time staff and an engaged board of directors made up of six women and three men with a wide diversity of environmental knowledge and backgrounds. One of our board members, Pete Burston, um, was a founder back in 1991, so he's uh, providing that continuity for us. Uh, and you can read a little bit more about their backgrounds on our website, but I am really impressed with some of the expertise that we are able to offer people. Uh, however, unlike a lot of uh, arts and culture and sports programs, we don't receive any core funding from the municipal government, and we don't have any stable financial support outside of fundraising and our sponsors. The good news right now is that we're, we're, we were awarded a one-year Resilient Communities Trillium Grant to look at new opportunities to try and create that stable organizational funding. And through this grant, we're going to be looking at streamlining what we do and how we do it. And it's definitely going to be a challenging uh, year for sure. And I definitely could use some help. And if anyone has any creative ways on how do you fund a uh, charity, uh, I would love to know them. We have three core programs. Our main one is tree planting. We're committed to planting 10,000 trees in Barrie. And right now we're focused on planting events with volunteers on public properties, so parks and EP areas. And Kevin Rankin's team uh, has been really help, uh, helpful in trying to find some of those locations that are, are plantable across the city. Our fruit share program connects up homeowners who have fruit trees with uh, volunteer fruit pickers who pick that fruit to share with the food bank. But of course, due to our funding shortfall, we've not really been running this program uh, for fully for several years, uh, but we still have it at this point. And Green Screen is what uh, our education program is, and it includes public events like workshops, documentaries, um, guided themed hikes, and thanks to COVID, a lot of online webinars lately. Uh, and we also, also offer people access to free, unbiased, scientifically backed information uh, with the expertise of our board of directors. But of all the things we do, we know the most important is climate change. 
pandemics, politics and wars has sadly put climate change action in the background right when we need it to be at the forefront. We need it to be not just the responsibility of government, but brought into the household level by helping people to understand what they can personally do. Climate change is a huge problem, so huge it can be overwhelming, and this can lead to inaction and disengagement. So Living Green took this big, big out of reach problem and boiled it down into 10 action areas. Each action has been assigned to a specific month of the year to form our annual work plan. We then focus all of our events and messaging to that action within that month and then repeat it year after year after year. So we know that uh, things like Earth Day, for example, is in April and we all have a general sense of what we should do on that day. And that's because the messaging on it has been consistent and repeated year after year after year. That kind of behavioral branding is what we hope to create with each of these actions. We want to make the complex simple. So people aren't so overwhelmed that they don't do anything. Which is why our first action is simply to be hopeful. This message is particularly important when speaking to the younger generations. It's hard to stay positive when the state of the world has never seemed so bleak. Wildfires, floods, droughts, and evidence that even this global pandemic is linked to climate change. And the hottest years on record have been in the last seven years. But there's reason for hope. Eight of the 10 largest economies have pledged net zero by 2050. The cost of solar and wind power has plummeted by 90% in the past decade. Municipalities can legislate actions that can affect about 45% of our national emissions. Most climate scientists agree that we've not yet reached the point of no return. It's soon, but not yet. So how do we fight against apathy or despair? Through hope and engaged action. A person with hope has the power to change the world. A person who hopes for something must believe that something is possible, but not inevitable. It is a pragmatic and reasonable action to ask for hope for climate change. Our second action asks people to think about where their money is invested. Fortunately, with costs dropping every day, renewable energy is often the best choice for the environment and for the economy. In March, we held a free webinar on green investing, which is posted to our website if you'd like to view it. In April, in conjunction with Earth Day, we asked people to go low waste and start to really think about where stuff goes when you're done with it. If you throw something away on a finite planet, there is no such place called away. It always goes somewhere. We want people to be offended by the amount of non-recyclable plastic we let into our houses and to think about the other R's like refuse and repurpose. Recycling is often held up as something that people do for the environment that gets them off the hook for other actions. But I recycle. But recycling is actually pretty in energy intensive and a lot of stuff that you think can be recycled actually is not. Reducing food waste is a significant climate action, especially organic, organic matter that makes its way into our landfill. When it's there, it breaks down as methane, which is 72 times more potent greenhouse gas than carbon, carbon dioxide. It's easy not to food, uh, waste food if you plan your weekly menu better, something I'm guilty of. I'd also like to start promoting more backyard composting and coming up with a better way to deal with pet waste. In May, we planted trees because this is the month that trees want to be planted in. We did eight different planting events in this month and we did ward plantings with half of the councillors and we'll be doing the other five wards this fall. These neighborhood tree stewards plantings happen midweek with smaller groups. The ward plantings are important because finding larger sites on public lands for the big community planting events is getting harder all the time, which leads me to a very important point about tree planting in general. People seem to know that planting trees is a crucial climate change action, but have not quite connected that it's more complicated than just plant more trees. We don't suffer from a lack of tree seedling availability or even the money to pay for, pay for those trees. We suffer from a lack of available land to plant those trees and to maintain them properly so they reach their full potential as a climate change mitigator. In June, we want people to engage in civil discussion and make sure that all levels of government are hearing their voices. Living Green isn't a political organization, but we lend our support to all the groups who are screaming, we need action on climate change and we need it now. We want an urgent yet civil discussion about what we're all going to do in our roles as leaders, as activists and as citizens. 
Then in the heat of July, we turn our thoughts to how we move around in our environment and we ask people to tread lightly. At 55%, private vehicle use is the largest emitter of Barry's greenhouse gas emissions. We need to get people walking, biking, taking transit, carpooling, and for those who will just never give up their car, making the switch to electric vehicles when they can. Uh, last weekend, we had our second Tread Lightly event in partnership with the Electric Vehicle Society, Firebird Cycle, and Open Air Dunlop. It went very well, except for the heat. Um, and we had a lot of great conversations about cars, bikes, busing, cycling, etc. In addition to promoting Bike the Night, we were offering people a chance to win a new mountain bike by competing in or completing a short poll about active travel. We asked people whether they've ever used Barry Transit, why or why not, whether they used a bike for transportation, why or why not, and whether they would consider making the switch to EV for their next vehicle. Um, I have some of the early results of these polls, nothing super surprising, but I'll share that with everyone after. But what I'd like to do is actually continue this poll at Bike the Night. Um, so we can continue to gather some more of this public information and maybe we get a little bit of nuggets of information as to why people are making the choices that they're making. Then in the heat of August, we asked people to think about being energy efficient and to power down. If you have the means, there are hundreds of ways to upgrade the efficiency of your home. Better insulation, heat pumps, converting to solar, purchasing better appliances, fixtures and windows. Well, who here wouldn't want a net zero home if we could afford it? Uh, but there's also cheaper and behavioral actions like unplugging, sealing drafts, programming your thermostat to how you actually live, and adjusting power settings on monitors, just to name a few. One of our board members is right now working on a sustainable home tour video series that will explore some of these ideas further. Then in September, when food's at, local food is at its peak, we turn our attention to what we eat. We want people to eat more local and include more plant-based meals. To be blunt and crude, cow farts are made of methane. And as I already pointed out, methane is 72 times more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So even a small reduction in the amount of meat and dairy we consume can make a big difference. During this month, we celebrate plant-based recipes and eating local, fresh, and in season. Last year, we had our first Harvest Share event at Shear Park, and it was really beautiful. We'd like to do it again this September at Leacock Park, and we'd like your help to help make it uh, larger and even more impactful. This event will happen on Saturday, September 24th, and we'll be asking people, uh, gardeners, especially new gardeners uh, and fruit tree owners, to bring out their excess fruit and veggies to be shared with the community. We had people coming from all over Barrie to share with the bounty and people came just to actually collect some of the food. I was really impressed with the amount of people that just heard about it and came down to get some free fresh food. With all the donated produce, we had volunteers sort it by quality because as you know, a lot of your backyard fruit and produce doesn't exactly resemble what you get in a grocery store. The table ready produce was divided up on a free table for people to take and the rest of it went to the Barry Native Friendship Center for their community to be shared. The blemished fruit was pressed into cider in an antique cider press Marty Lancaster brought out, uh, which was very cool to watch operate and the rest went to an animal rescue, uh, farm animal rescue for pig feed. And they were very excited to get all of that, um, all, the, all the cider waste in particular. So nothing was wasted at the event. And this year we wanna focus a little bit more on the education about some of the harvesting soft skills that have been lost in our urban lives. We're looking for experts who run demonstrations of canning techniques, uh, dehydration, um, some cooking demonstrations, composting. So if you know anyone that has some of these uh, sort of traditional skills around food and harvesting, we'd really love to have them be part of it and do some of these demonstrations. That's why I'm reaching out to this, um, this group for that. We started a uh, small planning committee already, we've already met a couple times, comprised of Living Green, Urban Pantry, uh, City Staff, I think Stephanie was there, uh, and the Berry Native Friendship Center. And our next meeting is on Wednesday, August 10 at 1030. So please let me know if you're interested in helping us to plan this event and all the things it could be. So back to uh, our 10 actions. Um, 
So as soon as we get done uh, the Harvest Share event, um, and of course, Bike the Night is the weekend before that, then we get back into planting again, because it's October. And um, it's such an important climate action. We put it on our top 10 list twice. Uh, we will be doing five more tree neighborhood tree steward plantings in wards two, three, four, six, and eight, and two weekend community planting events, including one that's going to be Halloween themed. It'll be close to Halloween. Um, recognizing that about three quarters of the land in Barrie is privately owned, we want to build a private land tree planting program that helps people to plant the right tree the right way in the right locations at their homes and businesses. But building a program like this requires resources we don't yet have. So that's all going to be part of my challenging building year. Our final action just simply asks people to buy less stuff, in particular, buying less plastics and low quality disposable stuff, which doesn't have to hurt our local economy either. Living Green is committed to offering ideas for people wishing to green their holidays and provide gift ideas that don't wreck the planet. We want to feature local businesses that are offering experiences, services, and green products that promote a circular economy, a switch to local and a switch to quality over quantity. The list of actions and the monthly plan associated with it is where we want to take this organization over the coming years. We really need the help of the private and public sectors to do it. Our challenge is to build our capacity and financial resilience as an organization while serving Barry and our growing network of volunteers who are looking for more opportunities to help. And that is my presentation. I will take questions if there is time to do it. Thanks, Andy. Awesome. Uh, any questions or comments from committee members? I see Eric Jacoby Hawkins, your hand went up. Go ahead. Uh yeah, first of all, I'll say it's a fantastic presentation. It's uh, uh, really well put together and the visuals are, are very strong. Um, I, I know certainly that the tree issue, um, there's a lot of enthusiasm for tree planting and there's a huge gap in knowledge about tree care. And I think that's, that's a big challenge. I know we got from the city uh, a pamphlet about caring for our new tree when they replaced our boulevard tree because of the previous one being an ash that had to be removed. Um, but I also, I know people buy trees. I don't think they get very good care instructions. We can see uh, below us on another street farther down that um, one of the neighbors put in a whole row of trees along their property line um, this spring, and we're seeing them all die now because they're, they're not watering them and they're not aware that um, they need all this watering, especially in a, in a drought year. And so I think that whole line of trees may be a complete write-off. Um, and I have a feeling that's happening all over the place. And I think that's uh, a huge challenge to get a wider societal knowledge of the fact that trees don't just grow themselves, <laughs> um, that they do need a lot of care in the early years for root development, or uh, you've just wasted your, your time and your effort and your money. Mm -hmm. Very, very good points. I don't know if Andy, you wanted to speak on that at all, or uh, just uh, thank you for that, Eric. Um, so I'm going to guess that those were cedars, probably, that they put in. And uh, a lot of times, what people are buying, especially if they're buying them from like Walmart or uh, Canadian Tire, they're getting uh, trees that um, really aren't meant for the seed zone. So it's like right from the get go, you've started right from the beginning with the wrong tree. And then if you're putting it in a location, you haven't done any soil prep or anything like that, it's really the wrong location for the wrong tree. And then, yeah, the aftercare is something that we've never really uh, fully understood in a way that is like, I would love to get it into schools. I want people to understand how a tree works. It's amazing how many people uh, seem to think that the tree is what you see from the ground up, but the tree, if you want it to live, is all happening underground. That's everything is about the roots, so. All right, I've got Kelly next and then Anne-Marie. Thanks, Andy, that was great. I love, I love the presentation and I love seeing it again and again. It's uh, getting better every time I see it learning more every time I see it, I think. Um, I think what, what really strikes me when, when I see this and I, I look at the 
Sorry, I Kelly. This is an opportunity. Kelly, um, your mic is cutting out every once in oh, a while. Oh, is it? Okay. I, yeah. Sorry. Oh, now it's gone. And now you're on mute. So I don't know. There we go. All right, how's that? Is this better? This okay, is better. super. Yeah. So I just really appreciate um, the the knowledge every time I see this presentation. I've seen it a few times, but I learn more every time I do, and, and it gets better and better. I really appreciate that. I, what I see as an opportunity is a um, partnership with the city. I see Living Green as somehow being a arm or, or some kind of connection with the city as we try to take action on, on climate action. Um, and I know, it, you know, it, it, funding and all of those pieces. So I, I think an opportunity uh, needs to be looked at um, with the, in relationship to the city. Um, I think that's a really important piece. And, and uh, I just see that as, you know, being quite obvious as we, as we grow as a city and we really need you, you know, as that organization to help us with our climate action because we're kind of missing the boat here. So I, I really think this is an important opportunity. I'm not sure how, but I think it needs to be explored. Um, I will say that uh, as part of our explorations uh, into how do we um, build financial resilience you know, because again, if we, if I don't have to be talking about funding and fundraising, all these things, we could be working on the actual actions. And that's, that's sort of the, the problem with all the whole not for profit sector is that is that how much do you spend trying to figure out how to fund the things as opposed to just doing the things, but we did get to go down to Peterborough and spent the day down there looking at what Peterborough is doing. And uh, they have an organization called Peterborough Green Up. And we got to meet with their executive director and chat with some of the things they do. And honestly, they're, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. They're miles ahead of Barry. <laughs> they just took a very different uh, path with it. And I know they have the university there that probably changes the dynamic. But one of the things is that um, the uh, Peter, city of Peterborough gives organizational support to Peterborough Greenup. And they have done it because they see that this is a financially responsible way of doing it because it's a cheaper way to deliver services to actually just support the not-for-profit who can also engage in activities that are a little bit, um, you know, be harder for the city to do with, um, you know, their financial and admi administrative uh, layers of bureaucracy in there. Um, so they fund them, they deliver all these services with things like, especially um, um, stormwater is one of the big ones. So again, they do a administer a rain garden program, you know, a lot of things that are just are going to help the bottom line for the municipality. So the problem, not the problem, the challenge is going to be to make sure that when um, I am able to go in front of council for any kind of financial ask, I want to make sure that I have it costed so you can see that this actually is just a financially responsible decision for the city to make and not just a feel good, we should do this kind of thing. That's some uh, really interesting points on that. And that's good to hear about Peterborough Green Up. Uh, I think there's probably some opportunities through. Um, first through the uh, stormwater climate action fund that the city's developing um, to potentially partner with the city in some way with a, a program like a rain garden program or something like that. So I'm not sure if you're engaged in conversations with city staff on that in particular. And then also with the uh, greenhouse gas community energy and greenhouse gas reduction plan through the action tables. Um, you know, there might be there might be an opportunity there. Um, for those types of partnerships too. I don't know if Andy, you're, you're engaged. Um, I am, yeah, so I've, okay. I've really, I've been having some good conversations. We did get uh, Living Green actually a seat as a stakeholder on both of those. So um, we're engaged in the conversation. Again, it's it's the uh, proof in the pudding or whatever the metaphor is. We just get to figure out how to do it. It's one of those, I think everyone can agree that this is a good model. You know, uh, building the residential tree planting program um, like a tree on somebody else's property benefits you. And it's like, it's not the same as somebody putting in a pool in their property doesn't benefit you, right? Whereas a tree benefits all, it's part of our green infrastructure. And as far as I can, um, you know, the information is out there that, you know, this is um, building a green infrastructure on private property 
benefits the public. And if we're going to make any gains, and this is what I was sort of alluding to in my presentation, we don't have a lot of public lands available for planting. If we're going to actually increase our tree canopy, we need to start looking at private uh, property and being okay with the idea that taxpayer dollars may go towards some of these um, private property initiatives that are going to get a green infrastructure that's going to do uh, all the things we need it to do. And as far as the um, Stormwater Climate Action Fund, absolutely. Um, I'm looking forward to the next meeting on that so we can see how where that's at. I think we're, we're due for something soon out of that group. Um, but I mean, a residential tree planting program is a, a stormwater project like the mm -hmm. that is there's a direct link to that and that is completely uh one of the cheapest ways that you can actually deliver some really good stormwater um efficiencies mm -hmm. and i think the exciting thing about that is that there's an actual funding mechanism built in too uh through the through the stormwater <laughs> fee uh okay i think um kelly was that it for your questions um you're good okay and Anne marie you're up next Thanks, Kenan. I had a couple of comments. Uh, things um, that you said just resonated with um, maybe our work plan and what's coming up in the fall. So we've got that private tree bylaw uh, with the public engagement session. Uh, and I know there was, they were trying to get everything to come back before the summer break, but I think it might be coming back this fall. When staff bring back the summary of the public consultation, perhaps that perhaps it becomes a really great opportunity for us to then have a conversation through this committee about what supports or synergies we see in alignment to private land tree planting program and building a case for that. The other piece that we talked about historically on this committee, I think it was asking for a budget. So it might fit later down on the agenda, but again, around some of these things, because Living Green has a formal seat on this committee and we are looking at those interdependencies between city programming and, and other community programming. Um, like Living Greens is, you know, what is, is there a budget to request for this committee to be able to be more of an active participant and, and leverage um, actions around supporting some things to move forward? So my understanding is some committees do receive or request a budget for their work plan, and I think it might be important for us to identify uh, for the next term of this committee how much money and, and if there are things there that we specifically want to be leveraging that tied to our strategic plan. And tied to the stormwater piece, I mean, that was one of what four different asset management plans that we as council supported. So if there is something there, I mean, there's a really nice alignment. Um, the other comment I had was maybe just coming back to tracking. I know um, to Andy, you presented the overall kind of 101 on living green to council. And there was a support for you to connect, but I'm wondering if that happened maybe with certain departments and if it didn't happen with, um, I'm thinking of, uh, around engineering and stormwater and that whole other side of the house, if there hasn't been a linkage to our asset management, some of the work Kelly Oakley has been doing that maybe that's a different meeting that might be of interest to kind of look at, uh, you know, if there's ever an ask of this committee to touch into a recommendation for the um, reserve or that funding source an understanding of why it relates to the work that we're doing at this committee and how it translates to some of the initiatives through Living Green. Just didn't want it to sit on one side that um, maybe didn't cross over to some of the asset management work. No, it's definitely on my uh on my radar to make sure that that's who I connect with for some of this. I know that you've connected me with a couple other uh, city staffers um, because I think that's one of the things as I, you know, I've, we've been intricately connected with um, both Kevin Bradley and Kevin Rankin's groups, but I feel like where the real gains are going to be is when we start getting into engineering and stormwater work, because A, they're going to have some funding and B, and is this is more of an opinion kind of thing, but it seems that when you go into lean times, uh, parks and forestry get cut and some of the engineering's don't. So <laughs> it might be yeah. a smarter, smarter well, group to align with. And again, it is green infrastructure. Like we are talking about, this is going to be a climate change mitigation uh, tactic and a way to do it. And I think a way that can be um, done more fiscally responsibly. 
Yeah, and I think sometimes we get caught up in the conversation or assumption that it's about trees. And so yeah. I think it creates um, a natural bias towards a different thought process versus, hmm. you know, Wilf and others have spoken um, at this committee about, and you've started to do the tread lightly aspects, but just the cost savings. And it ties nicely into Adam's work. And even when he presented to council on the greenhouse gas reduction strategy, uh, you know, we had some Q&A with him that talked a lot about myth busting, like how do we get residents to opt into some of the things you're suggesting around even like how we manage electricity, but also, um, and I even heard at the Tread Lightly event when we were talking with individuals um, with the EV vehicles, which is how much does it cost to actually charge? What exactly do I need for my garage? And, and Wilf has spoken, I think, at length around, you know, how we can there's really some great education that needs to happen to follow along with helping people to buy into that behavior change. And so I see that as being a whole nother part of the conversation to maybe amplify and tie the financial savings into how do we support people uh, from a human behavior to kind of take that next step and to kind of think about what's possible or hopeful uh, around how they can actually play a different role around energy conservation. I did reach out to Adam uh, ahead of designing the uh, survey question for the uh, Tread Lightly event. So again, that information, once we compile it again, I think once we get a lot more done at the Bike the Night event, um, then I can feed that back to them. And I think it'll actually be really, I don't know if the city put out that kind of informal survey, but it may help a little bit inform because as we all know, if you've ever gone to a city public information center, they're not usually the most well attended of events. <laughs> so this is kind of a better way, like taking it to the streets and getting some of that uh, boost the ground information. And of course, you know, so Adam helped us sort of design what, what information they might want. Um, and Caitlin, I also got to meet with her. Um, and then we'll again, be able to feed that back to them. That's great. And I'm not sure if it ties over, but I would just say, I mean, this, even having your presentation recorded, and I know again, the same one was, you know, a similar one was recorded to council, but could be really great for other committees to have as an orientation uh, in addition to the next council. So it might just be a promotion of, you know, uh, this meeting link being something that new members watch, the new members should be change over quite a bit of this committee, but I would even say communities and blooms having similar conversations, right? Around how do we put a spotlight on active transportation and transit? The whole criteria for communities and bloom might even be something to be aware of because it changed from 2019. There's a whole different matrix we worked through with judges last week. So um, I'm going to, I don't want to get this wrong. I think it was Jason um, um, presented to us around what was happening in transit. Am I right, Brett, that it was Jason? I hope I didn't get it wrong. My memory <laughs> kind of in a couple of different th thought processes, but we had a presentation here about what we could not couldn't do, I think through transit around um, bus stop rooftop gardens uh, and water conservation tied to seed and plantings and also active transportation. Um, we got a really great response to this committee, but the same conversation happened at Communities in Bloom um, and staff were able to come across and present um, about what was or wasn't possible. That actually translated to them being identified uh, and spoke with the judges. And the whole conversation is much more broader, of course, than just beautification through flowers, but native species, but also into how are we connecting people to place differently and inviting them into the outdoors and community collisions. Um, and so I think this ties quite nicely and we might wanna think a bit about the mandates uh, as we come into communities and bloom and active transportation sustainability because there are things that were highlighted through that team with the judges and they highly complement the things that we've been discussing or have been doing um, through tree planting and, and other things. Anyways, those are my comments, but I think we just need to also broaden out the conversation the tables that we've, we've been talking to. I'd like that. Thanks, Emory. And um, on the, uh, you had mentioned the uh, piece about the budget for this committee too. Um, that's something that I've included in the uh, legacy items um, that I'll be presenting on uh, for that that uh, the transition document. I guess it's called on the uh, agenda. Um, so that's definitely something that uh, I think we can push for with the new term. Um, anything else, Emory, or are you good? 
No, and it was Jason Zimmerman. I blanked there for a minute, but just kudos to the team because I think staff too that are tied to some of the work that in conversations have been able to carry it forward into different tables. Great. Any other questions or comments on Andy's presentation? Not seeing any hands. Uh, Andy, would you like to add anything else before we? Uh... Just a final pitch if you guys want to be involved in Harvest Share. We do need to sort of plan this thing and get it up and running uh, soon. So please just reach out to me separately if you have interest in it. That's it. Thank you for the opportunity. Welcome. I've got some contacts. I'll send your way to Andy. That's great. All right. Thanks. So um, that brings us to our first discussion item, uh, which is an update on uh, Bike the Night. Um, and uh, I'll let the group that's been working on it take that away. I don't know who wants to take the lead um, on that. I see Anne-Marie unmuting. Who wants to Kelly and putting Laurel. Her hand yeah. Sure, so, I can start. Um, we're, um, we are uh, getting there. <laughs> I, I'll let Andy speak to a couple of things too about the printing and materials and that sort of thing. I think we ran into a couple of glitches with budgets, um, items uh, around counselors' money versus being able to use it for certain things. So I, don't, I, I can't speak to that directly, but I think uh, Andy can. Um, so uh, the permit uh, process has been, a, been an interesting process. Um, I kind of completed it about a month and a half ago and, and hadn't heard anything and I kept getting approvals in. And then all of a sudden I, I got a bunch of roadblocks. So. Um, <laughs> we're we're working through that, uh, trying to uh, and and it's great. Stacy at um, at the BIA is going to help with a couple of items as well. So I think we will um, we'll manage through that for sure. It'll uh, it'll work out really well once we uh, once we get that. I'll I'll be reaching out <laughs> for some help on developing a development of the emergency plan uh, as well as the COVID plan. And I may I may reach out to the uh, to Sarah and uh, for that uh, assistance. So as soon as that gets submitted, but everything else is, is basically uh, on an approval level, um, uh, good to go. Um, the only item that uh, we're kind of missing is funding uh, for uh, the first aid uh, team that has to be on site. So it's about a $900 uh, investment that we need to, we need to cover. And I don't think we can do it through the council's money, uh, the councillor's money, whether that was Sergio's or, or Keenan's. So um, we need to kind of sort that out, but everything is coming along. I think, Andy, I'm not sure what the update is on people that are registered, but maybe I'll let you speak to that. Um, I know Sarah had uh, updated that as well. So yeah, everything is, is coming along and moving forward. Um, we've got our meeting this week, so we'll tie up some loose ends as well so we can have an update. Um, but we've got another meeting on Thursday this week. That's my update. So whoever else wants to add? I, I will say that, um, yeah, so the, the budget from um, Sergio is not going to come through because I think he, when he had committed to it, it was for, um, it was, how do you put it? I was basically told by the mayor's office that uh, it wouldn't been covered because it's not a project, it's not a community improvement project, it's an event. And that events aren't covered from this fund. So we don't have that sort of free and clear money that we thought we had. Uh, Keenan, correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as uh, your commitment to it as well, it could be uh, for in-house printing and things like this. So again, we have a, I think we've got to figure out the financial piece because um, like we're not, Living Green's not seeing any of the money being recovered that we've put into it. And now we have this $900 paramedic bill that we can't cover. So. I hate talking about it, but it seems to be the thing that right now is just, is just, it's not working. We, maybe this is now we need to reach out and try and find some unfettered sponsorship dollars that might help with some of these things. But uh, yeah, I hate being that wet blanket, but that seems to be where we're at right now. So um, I think with, uh, so the way we passed the motion was about in-house printing, but there might be a way for us to get around it 
using because because I'm not using the same budget that Sergio was using. He was using the ward specific projects budget. I'm using my actual counselor's office communications budget, which is more flexible. Um, but um, just because of the way we did the motion, that's why it was speaking to in-house printing. But I think we might be able to get around that um, with an invoice, but maybe I can pull Andy. Andy, would it be best for you to meet with me and maybe the clerk's office um, to kind of figure out the logistics of that yeah. um, and what's allowed? Because even, even the... Um, is it St. John Ambulance uh, fee? That might even be able to be covered by my counselor budget because I know that's a lot more flexible um, than the ward specific project budget. So um, yeah. I'll loop you into a, an email with the clerk because um, she's the one that knows all the rules and uh, guidelines around the, the council funding. Um, when, are, when are you guys having your uh, bike the night meeting this week? Thursday, two o'clock. Two o'clock. Um, I'll try to get some uh, more information from the clerk's office before then, if not an actual meeting with her uh, before then. But um, yeah, I'm sorry that it's been not a smooth process um, for the funding. That's frustrating. That's good. If we could clarify that, that would be amazing, Keenan, before Thursday, just so we can pivot and then talk a bit about strategies. If because that's those are pretty well the the biggest pieces is really just the the com material and expenses out of pocket based on funds that were thought to be there, uh, and if then the St. John so that would be a big help and I think would probably resolve most of what we've got left to address outside of what we can handle through um, just our emergency plan. And I will say I think we at last time I talked to you and I'm sure there's been a few more come in that we had over close to 150 people registered already. And again, we did it through Facebook, uh, but we linked it to an Eventbrite. So people actually had to sign up as if they're getting a paid ticket, even though it's for free. So I feel like there's a, like that 150, there's a really good chance that they would all come as opposed to Facebook people saying they're coming and they don't come. But, but once you do this event, right, they get a, a ticket and a reminder uh, a couple of days before and then the day of, you know, so I, I think it is, you know, we are looking at a pretty uh, significant amount of people coming. Those are even mm -hmm. the, just the people that said they're coming. We don't know how many people. Yeah. So that also makes me a little nervous because, uh, yeah, it's a large amount of people. It's good. The I guess maybe the only final call out that pro will probably hit our agenda on Thursday correctively are if any members of this committee um, that are not on the planning committee for Bike the Night are around or interested in attending, um, we will be looking for some volunteers just to support um, very police and others that we've got at different kind of stations along the route, um, be it on bike, but some that we would just want on foot that helps to guide people back on to making sure that they are taking the right route as they kind of do a bit of an out and back loop. So if you know anyone around and interested, um, we'll look at kind of getting dressed up and being nice and visible and helping to maybe have some guide flags to usher in uh, some of our individuals of all ages that'll be on their bikes. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so should the, so any members of this committee that are interested, should they reach out to you, and Make it okay. easy. Just uh, okay. just hit me by email and let me know. Okay, great. All right. Anything else on bike the night? All right. I can't believe next month is September. Thanks. <laughs> Exciting though. Okay. Uh, not seeing anything else on that. So the next item we had on the agenda was on the move. Um, and uh, I see that Sherry's not here and I know she was the one that wanted to have this on the agenda, but Sarah, I, I, I'm not sure if you're uh, going to be presenting on it or talking about on the move. So I can provide an update provided by by Sherry. Oh, um, awesome. Or Brady, did you want to do that? I know there was some some email back and forth. Well, she did send an email uh, for a few things that could be read out to the committee um, that I'm more than happy to read in for her. Um, with respect to questions, I myself won't be able to answer any. Um, I'm not sure, Sarah, how in-depth you'd be able to answer the questions, but I could at least read the, the email that was sent um, 
by Sherry. So, so she says, go ahead. I can do the same. Um, I might be able to answer sort of those uh, mitigation adaptation around climate change and sustainability questions. Otherwise, I can just record questions um, and have Sherry get back to you on that. Um, and that's just because we we work for different teams. So while our teams collaborate on several initiatives, this is sort of led by Sherry's Sherry's team. So um, either approach, if you want to do it, Brady, that's great. If if you prefer me to share yeah, Sherry's update and, that works too yeah no if you want to go ahead and read it and then that way as the questions kind of come in you can kind of record them or answer what you know and then I'll be here to back up just in case there's any issues okay sounds awesome. good so please um I apologize and please stand with me but as as you've probably taken note I am sort of reading Sherry's updates so uh the next meeting for the Simcoe Muskoka active travel steering committee is scheduled for Tuesday, August 9th from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Um, and this meeting continues to be virtual. And the next, next meeting is open to any new stakeholders uh, to attend to learn about the group and potential activities being discussed at a regional level uh, or potential to become involved in some way. And if uh, new participants join this meeting, there are no obligations. It's just sort of a, a come and learn session and seeing future opportunities. Uh, so at present, there are representatives from school boards, municipalities, public health and community groups, such as the environmental network. So if you have questions or like to receive this meeting invitation, um, you can email Sherry Diaz and I can uh, share that with the group afterwards or myself and I can connect you with, with Sherry. So that's update number one. <laughs> number two, uh, so the Simcoe Muskoka Catholic District School Board has recently become more involved in the promotion of active school travel, and they are now attending the regional steering committee meetings. Formerly, it was mainly representatives from Simcoe uh, County District School Board who have been involved in the steering committee with certain schools from the board receiving uh, facilitated support. So update three, there is a small group of public health and school board staff currently working on back to school social media messages. So Sherry can share these with um, the committee or this committee when they are ready later in August. If the committee members are interested in promoting active tr school travel messages for return to school this fall. Uh, and so again, if you're interested in that, please reach out to Sherry Diaz through email. Um, I think everyone will have that. And if not, again, we can share that. Um, and then lastly, we will be reconnecting with the Barry schools this fall. Um, and those who have had previously been working with using the active school travel planning model to develop their um, interest and capacity to contribute to their on the move activities. Um, this includes Kendall Heights, Trillium Woods, Willow Landing, Oakley Park. Um, so things have essentially been on hold due to the pandemic and this sort of fall will be reassessing um, what can be achieved. So following this, we will, we public health staff will assess our capacity to work with additional schools. Um, and if someone is aware of Barry schools with an interest or readiness to move ahead on active school travel and promotion um, and receive support, feel free again to email Sherry. So that are, those are the updates that I have to share. Um, if there's any questions, I will try to answer them, but most likely I will record them and, and share them with Sherry. Thanks, Sarah. Awesome. Uh, I see Kelly's here. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I, one of the things that I wanted to make sure we did this fall, uh, we did have signs that were made available for Cundles Heights uh, Public School on minutes, you know, five minutes to ride your bike from this point, 10 minutes. And I believe the city does have them in hand. I would love to see those um, installed uh, for this uh, coming school year. So I'm not sure who we can uh, talk to to make that happen. 
Yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, Sherry uh, would probably know. I know Sherry had presented about the materials that they have on hand, and the resources, the communication resources that they have on hand. And I think it was uh, Justin from Transit who um, might have mentioned that they, they have some of the materials as well. Uh, Anne-Marie, did you have something to add on, on that point specifically? Yeah, we did have an update a little while ago um, about the status of the signs. So I'm wondering if it's easier, Sarah, just so I don't get it wrong, if that can come back because there was a delay in those four schools as part of the project for the signage going up, I think with COVID. Um, and I'm not sure if there's a implementation plan now. And then there was a broader conversation, I think around how to get signs up in all of our schools across the city of Barrie regardless of being in the pilot and what would it cost to do that if the purchasing of the signs perhaps could be a consideration of the, the city um, and the install was more sitting uh, with a, a school and city communication. But if that could come back, I think that what might be helpful around those four, not just Cundles Heights, but the, there are three others in various part of the project that I think have yet to go up. I have made note of that and, and we'll, uh bring this forward to Sherry. Okay, thanks. Justin, I saw you coming on. Did you have anything about that? I'm trying to remember there was a delay in that, but the relationship yes. between the signs. Um, sorry about that. Yes. So we, uh, Sapphire, actually going to go out this week. I've yeah, made arrangements with our operations crew to kind of do a walkabout. So there are two signs. There's a five minute walking route and a 10 minute walking route um, that we will be installing at the four locations throughout Barrie. Um, so they're Cundles Heights, uh, Trillium Woods, which is a school at Veterans and... Yeah. Harvey, um, Oakley Park, which yeah, I believe yeah. is Davison Grove. area, yeah. and um, uh, Willow Landing, which is Big Bay Point. Um, so we will be kind of looking to target, kind of uh, call them collector kind of feeder areas as kids kind of come in. Uh, the exact locations are to be determined, but we will be looking to get those erected and ready for um, the September start. We may have to put a comfort a couple so, yeah, on temporary I'm stands sure. because uh, locates are a little bit timely um, to try to get back, but we will have them installed for the September start. So that is uh, our game plan and um, that will hopefully all be sorted out this week. So uh, just for reference, the five minute walking distance is about a 300 meter radius of the school property. Um, and then the 10 minute, or 10 minute walking distance is a 600 meter radius. Um, and that's based on a standard walking speed of one meter per second. So, Thanks for that uh, update, Justin. We appreciate that. No problem. Um, Anne-Marie, did you have anything to add? And let me see Kelly's hand as well. Yeah, I don't know if Kelly's was back or a new one. Go ahead, Cal, if you had a follow-up. Thank you. Um, thank you, Justin. I appreciate that. I guess a couple of clarity questions. So is it walking and cycling? That's my first question. And um, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, they are, I forget the exact wording. I think it's a five minute walk and a three minute cycle and like a 10 minute walk and a seven minute cycle. I forget the exact wording of the signs, but um, I'm more familiar with walking speed seeing with like programming of traffic signals than I am with like average cycling speeds. So um, from, from my ease of my placements, I'm based in on the walking speed, but the signs are referenced for both. And there is a bit of a time variable difference on the sign. I believe okay. it's about a two minute, three minute difference between the two. That's great. And my second question is, um, did you say there were two signs per school? Truthfully, I don't remember the exact quantities off the top of my head. I believe there was four signs per school, two five minutes and two 10 minutes. Right, okay. And then the third question is, is this being coordinated with the school principal um, to coordinate the um, installation and uh, education, I guess. So the communication piece around how this is being um, promoted with the school. So we did kind of do the walkabouts with the schools um, and I'll call it early 2020. Some of it generally wasn't the principals. It was some form of subcommittees. A lot of it was uh, like a vice principal and or teacher that was part of whatever program it kind of jived with. Like for instance, uh, Willow Landing was with the vice principal and it was part of the uh, climate change group. Um, so it really depends on that. So 
at the current time, no, we haven't reached out to the schools because um, schools are closed. We'll kind of set them up, but if we find that they're in ineffective where they are, it's just a couple of bolts. It's not overly complicated to move if we if we if we need to. But um, we did do walk-in routes with the schools, and we set up kind of um, typical catchments. So we've kind of got a, a pretty good understanding. Like for instance, um, Willow Landing, there's a main catwalk at the back that feeds into the school. I'd probably try to do something as you get into that crescent that leads in, which I believe is Leggett, um, kind of feeds into the school from, from the north end. Um, and then on the south end, they kind of cut through the park. So I may look to kind of do something that, uh, kind of a catchment of where that goes in through the park. But um, no, we have not kind of coordinated with the schools, most likely given that um, city staff have a little bit more of technical experts, we'll kind of determine where we think the best location is, kind of map them out and then pass them off to, to the health unit to coordinate um, because Sherry's key contact to the schools and mm-hmm. go from there as opposed to the reverse. Um, it, it's just my experience is probably the best. Um, and then if there is need, we can change them. As I said, it's not overly complicated to unbolt and rebolt. So that's great. It, yeah, as long as it's coordinated with the school. So, you know, the signs are going up and they know that um, they need to educate their kids about these signs. I really appreciate that, Justin. Thank you. Not a problem. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Emery, see your hand again. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I'll send the link just as um, maybe a backdrop. Um, to Brandy to send out, because I don't think we've got a chat box here, but as Justin's relaying, so the the health unit has the full strategy online for background around the brand and the relationship to Green Communities Canada, which might be great to see how it's structured around school engagement. And then the other piece, maybe just as a point of interest, I've just joined the active school travel steering committee. So I'll be at that meeting on Tuesday as well can help bring information back uh, as it relates to it. Okay. Um, but Justin, I didn't know, um, once the signs are up, if you could flag this committee, if it's before we meet again, because I think it would also maybe be interesting for the Bike the Night group to see about opportunities to promote um, the signage in alignment with kind of getting kids ready and participating in kind of um, practicing safe on road uh, skills. Uh, every year we see kind of the reminders for school buses on the road and kids taking uh, active transportation modes to school uh, and doing some of that before September um, bike the night event. I think we're looking at trying to look at how we can engage and encourage individuals to uh, start getting comfortable with their bikes before the event too. Certainly, yeah. The, the key maps to be prepared to send off to kind of the uh schools we can definitely just forward them along uh, to the committee as well okay not a problem yeah and as far as the uh the central committee for the active school um staff myself in particular do sit on that committee as well so um we are up to speed on on all of that so awesome that's fantastic thanks justin because i'm thinking maybe it'd be nice for the bike the night group to engage those schools soon after uh justin relays that the signs are up and then we can kind of see what they need to support maybe having a team or a group ride uh, as part of the event. No more questions for me though, more just comments about uh, that. Awesome, thanks Emery. Uh, and thank you, Justin, for providing all those updates. Uh, thanks again, Sarah, for the on the move presentation. Any other questions on, on the move? Not seeing any. Okay. Um, so with that, um, we can move on to the next agenda item, which is uh, the transition document for the new term. Uh, so I'll start sharing my screen. I've got a little uh, presentation here. Okay. Can everyone see that? Seeing nods, okay, awesome. Uh, how do I start a slideshow on Google Slides? Oh, there it is. Okay. All right, so uh, the approach I, I took um, with this um, was to try to make this um, digestible uh, and accessible for the new committee. Um, so I've kind of taken um, seven of the key uh, initiatives uh, that I think the work of the Active Transportation Sustainability Committee 
kind of falls under. I took some feedback um, from previous discussions we've had uh, and incorporated that. Um, and uh, I'm hoping to package this as uh, basically a memo or, or uh, an information packet for the new committee members um, with all the documentation um, attached as appendices um, with some of uh, the tracking of the items that we passed throughout this term as well um, for their information. Um, so um, these are the, the seven items um, that uh, I, I feel I capture the sort of core of our work. I um, mean, I'll go through them one at a time uh, too. Um, and I'm looking here for, for feedback uh, from the committee on this approach to sort of the transition, whether we think this is a good approach, whether we think there's anything missing on any of these individual items or on the whole. Um, so um, I started off with the Community Energy and Greenhouse Gas Reduction Plan um, because uh, it's sort of an all-encompassing plan for the community on uh, sustainability issues and uh, active transportation is a key part of, of this, uh, this plan as well. Um, so um, I wanted to highlight the importance of this by, by having it first on the list. Um, and so I've just included, I wanted to keep it simple, just included a link to the actual plan, um, who the staff contacts are. Um, and um, I was thinking as part of the, the final package that presents, uh, gets presented to the new committee, um, we suggest uh, a series of presentations at the beginning of their term uh, from the staff contacts on each of these uh, overarching strategies um, so that um, everyone's starting off from the same page and knowing sort of where the city's already headed. Um, any questions on, on this first piece at all? Let's see. Any. Oh, Kelly, yeah. You're on. Yeah, just quickly. Um... Uh, what do you mean by advocating for funding? Yeah, um, so there's currently no funding. So uh, that's a, it's a good point. I think this could be expanded on in, in the document as well. Um, there's currently no funding advocate, uh, allocated to uh, the actual actions in the community energy uh, and greenhouse gas reduction plan. So um, you have the big moves uh, in, in the plan around um, a home energy retrofit program and transitioning to uh, electric vehicles and promoting active transportation. And we've got no funding or uh, actual programs in place so far. Um, so uh, that's what I mean. Uh, it's a, there's a plan right now and uh, nothing's really backing it up. I think, um, I should probably expand, that brings up a, a, an important point about this uh, document. I, I think I should probably expand on um, opportunities for engagement with this greenhouse gas reduction plan. There are the action tables um, in the plan um, that will include stakeholders in the community and city staff. Um, and perhaps that's an opportunity for this committee to be more involved uh, in those action tables. Um, and I can talk to Adam and Caitlin about that, about how best to recommend to the community that they be involved in those action tables. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Um, any other questions on this piece? Um, and feel free to give feedback on the whole thing at the end too, or after the, the committee meeting as well. Uh, and I will try to incorporate that. Um, so the next big piece that I chose is the Cycleberry Infrastructure Program, um, which uh, is the city's first dedicated infrastructure program um, for cycling. Um, and I added here, uh, I wanted to, to give a shout out to safe and separated facilities in particular, um, since those are, uh, I think, should be our highest priority uh, and will make the biggest difference uh, in terms of getting people to uh, use active transportation. Um, so provided a link there uh, to the, the page on the city's website um, and staff contact Brett. Um, I think there's going to be uh, a lot of opportunities once this program gets rolling for education and outreach and I think this committee can be a great resource um, for staff uh, in terms of that link to the community. 
um, but then also advocating um, to council to make sure that the highest quality infrastructure is funded and can be pushed up even. Uh, like, let's try to do it as soon as possible since time is running out. Um, any, uh, any questions on this piece or any comments or feedback on this piece and how it's presented? Not seeing any. Yeah, Amber. Yes. I guess for the next committee, depending on the turnover, uh, are we asking for there to be an effort to reapply to this uh, or an orientation to say how, you know, who's kind of tracking oversight of our change over time on all the metrics? And when in the next four year term should we be reapplying again? So is there a goal setting here around uh, actually um, applying to be a cycle friendly city? Yes, so you read my mind. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I uh, thought this was a, a great way uh, for us to sort of track the progress uh, since we do have that uh, past feedback on our unsuccessful applications. Um, I need to add the link in there um, and I think I can post it. I'll have to post it to a Google Drive or something to make it accessible or just attach it to the final document in a, as an appendix so that they have all that past feedback because I think that was shared through Sherry who was on the, the uh, working group before. Um, yeah. And in addition to the yeah. feedback, so Kelly and that small group um, with staff, I think, did a lot of work around even looking at um, the feedback from the last evaluation, but also what have we done since then and opportunities. So I think there was kind of a, a finer look. And so that would be an important document to make sure move forward to the next committee. Mm -hmm. I think it were at least some notes and reflection around uh, what have we actually done since and where were we as current current state perhaps last year. I think that was done, Kelly, if that's if I'm remembering right. Yeah, um, I think so. And also Sherry was going to take another look at it as well. So I, I think we've looked at it a couple of times. There is a matrix uh, for sure. Um, I don't know if we've made any progress since the last matrix update, but um, yeah, that's definitely a document that needs to be included. Yeah, so maybe at least year one is a check-in and kind of a refresh scan and then maybe a, a goal set specifically for when we apply again in year two or year three of that committee. Yeah. Um, okay, so do you think um, in terms of the recommendation to the new committee, like, do you think we should add to this paragraph here, like, um, set a goal on when to apply, reapply? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it would that. be a, yeah. a buyer before what 2025 before. So it still falls within what's doable over the next term, but yeah, but sooner if you know, we've made progress in some of these items, but with a goal that by 2025, we've actually applied and we're getting the feedback before the end of that term. Yeah, that's great. Idea. That's my thought. I'm not sure about yeah. others. Any other thoughts on that, Andy? Well, I'm just wondering where one would um, maybe mention Firebird Community Cycle and uh, to make sure if any new members are coming in, they're aware of what this group is trying to do and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm again not sure where that would be fit in there, but I, I think that they're a key one that uh, that could be playing a big role in this uh, this action. That's is it a is it a broader piece too? I'm not sure about how deep you want to get with subcommittees, but I know with bike the night we want that to continue. We've got some pieces that tie to kind of the resident engagement side of active transportation, so maybe it's a consideration for the next committee to also look at if a subcommittee is needed to um, facilitate some of these things and Firebird be a member of that, invited member of that subcommittee. Yeah, In I, addition I, to what Andy's saying. Yeah, I, I like that idea, that suggestion. Um, so, and this raises some, some bigger questions about the transition document too, which I think are important, like um, perhaps an appendix or a section on uh, just key stakeholders and how they fit into the work that this committee does because um, we've got living green nature berry um, has been involved in things that this committee does uh, so giving sort of a quick overview of uh, those organizations and, and how yeah. they've been involved and then also the subcommittees themselves the work that they've done in this this term um, and then maybe some suggestions on um, subcommittee structure uh, and membership for the new term 
Yeah, on that thread, just so people don't have to walk through all the agendas, I'm not sure if it's easy to pull a quick one pager together of different stakeholders that have presented or we've had come to the meeting so there can be some continuity in the next term. Yeah, I could, uh, I could probably handle that and do that. Um, yeah. I don't know where yeah. to keep it, but Keenan, just maybe, the dates are helpful. Yeah. I was just going to add, Keenan, maybe another appendix would be the goals or the timelines around things. Like you have one for um, your partners and then a second one that would have dates. Like if rather than trying to put the 2025 on here, like or maybe you do that too, but putting a bit of a, like a schedule or priorities for timelines. Yeah, I do like that idea. Um, that would take some work to get together, <laughs> but I could probably figure, because I'm thinking in terms of how granular we want to get, like. Right. Um, I was thinking it would just be like, you know, um, if there's a, deadline for each of these actions do we have that in there or you know yeah. the target date for completion of something but then like Anne Marie already said you could start it could get pretty pretty complex if you started adding things like bike the night every year in September or whatever like you could it could really spiral into mm -hmm. yeah I'll do I'll do some work on that and some thinking around that uh, around the timeline appendix um, I think that would be helpful and we could just add, sorry, we could add, uh, yeah, just a few key dates and maybe not get too, too granular in terms of the actual strategies we're mentioning here. Like I was oh, thinking sure. like, yeah. like the greenhouse gas reduction plan, like she would be adding timeline, timelines from that plan into our timelines right, here. Right. That might be a little too much, but uh, maybe committee specific timelines we could get into, but uh, that's a great suggestion. Um, and I will work around with that, play around with that a bit. Um, okay, anything else uh, on the bicycle for the communities or any other thoughts that are coming up right now about the transition document in general? I don't, I, without seeing ahead, I'm not sure if I'm covering this, but um, I was going to hold that you mentioned the climate change plan, but not the adaptation, which is a whole nother strategy. Is it in your deck, Keenan? It is in there too. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll move to this next item. So this is more of a structure of the committee uh, slide. Um, so it talks about that budget um, that we, we are hoping to have as a committee. Um, and I've, I've put it here as for events, outreach and promotion. Uh, I don't know if we wanna expand that um, in terms of our suggestion to the new committee for what they advocate for, but that seems to me like the most likely thing we would use a budget for as a committee. Um, and then I've added uh, the suggestion from Wilf here, consider a meeting structure that allows for equal time to be dedicated to active transportation and sustainability issues so that we're, we're having uh, an equal focus on each of those categories. Uh, any other, uh, uh, oh, I made some notes earlier when Anne Marie was talking around, you know, maybe we should be making a specific suggestion here to the new term around an amount uh, for the budget. Um, so I don't know how committee members feel about that. Or, well, considering bike the night, it's kind of come at the grace of other people's budgets. Maybe a two thousand dollar budget with a sustainability plan for bike the night or more, but. I don't know what's reasonable. Brandy, if you would have that information through the clerks, if she could even gather what other committees have asked and what's been supported. But I would kind of say between two and $5,000 um, with some opportunity, I don't know, like maybe you want more, but at least something there. So we're not coming into the budget. They won't motion on that, but if we need an intake form into the 2023 budget, we probably want to give it some guidance, not too much longer out. Yeah. Do you want to put it um, as a per a per annum? So say twenty five hundred dollars per year. Yeah, I definitely think it should be a per annum budget. Um, that's a great suggestion to make that clear. I know. What's uh, up? Yeah, go ahead, Wolf. Hey, thanks, Keenan. I don't know whether you want to <clears throat> uh, use this time or or get into. Um, this is a bit later because this is obviously a budget uh, item here, uh, just on the structure of the committee and the types of tasks that we um, 
we want to tackle in future years, um, which might be the segue to how much money do we need and what should we be asking for in the budget. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, you, uh, help me understand, sorry. You're... Sorry, I was not very clear on that. Um, <laughs> it, your your uh, your topic here is budget, and I I'm just asking whether wondering whether this we want to do a bit of a deeper dive on uh, what this committee um, is going to try to tackle in coming years, uh, be, um, which is a separate discussion in a sense, but is also the segue to what sort of what type of budget might we need for some of the other activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think that's what this whole discussion around the transition document is meant to uh, to be about. Um, like, what are the key, what do we think are the key active transportation and sustainability issues that the new term should focus on? And that's kind of why I took this approach of looking at, you know, these plans and strategies that the city has already adopted um, and how do we actually implement them and move them forward? Um, it seems to me like it's, probably the um, the best route for the new committee to, to sort of put the pedal to the metal on those plans and strategies that already exist because uh, you know they'll have a stronger case to counsel um, in that sense but I don't I don't know um, like I'm open to other suggestions about how we present um, you know what initiatives or issues we think the new committee should focus on um, do we, yeah. The 2,500 per year might at least be protective of the bike the night until the new term decides on what's a sustainability plan. Um, and then again, the new term deciding on, depending on what you, what you wanna take on year over year, adding to that budget, or is it part of me is thinking maybe more of it, depending on the strategy is not the budget of the committee, it's probably ensuring that there's advocacy or some type of motion to identify the importance of when council's making the 2023 annual budgets, um, what's not cut or the relationship to the climate adaptation uh, and greenhouse gas emissions strategies um, when staff are putting their intake um, forms into the budget, that there's an appreciation of how important that is to some of our climate action work. So it might, not be the committee budget it might just be how do we ensure that the city's departmental budget uh is supported for those strategies mm -hmm. just a thought yeah uh, absolutely i think that's yeah we're kind of talking about two different things here yeah the, the budget is just for what our activities are for this committee or just for what our committee activities but then yeah we have a bigger role to play in terms of advocating people on those um city actions in these plans um wolf did you, yeah yeah I, I think i think i sort of echo uh, what both of you are saying is uh, the committee itself might need a budget uh, from time to time to um, say perhaps hire an expert to give a presentation or a recommendation to support something that we want to bring to council um but the uh, you know the, the 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 initiatives like bike the night and so on they deserve their own budget um and i, and I think it's this committee's role probably to ask council for budgets for those specific initiatives and that's going to vary uh, year to year, depending what we're working on. Uh, the question that strikes me here is what does the committee itself need for a budget? Does it need a budget? Um, or is that something uh, that we ask for as we need it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you raise an important question around, um, you know, what, what else are we going to use a budget for? Um, yeah. I, I, I like I, I don't know I, the hiring the expert thing like yeah I mean potentially uh, would do people have thoughts on on that piece at all or or what other things we could use a budget for and maybe we should consider uh, Andy um, so where I struggle with uh, living green is again I, you hear me like a broken record around like how do we fund these things but I mean the events that we are putting on we are doing it uh, piecemeal with whatever we can cobble together but it always strikes me in the back of my head that you know when we do something like a harvest share event like how much that is a benefit to the city 
you know, so a lot of the events that were already sort of created and that we're already working on are ones that really should have almost been supported by the city, you know, and so without being too bold and saying you should just support us, but it is kind of one of those, like we've already been doing a couple of these uh, annual events and we work through the um, kinks and found out that, yeah, at the very least, yes, this is worth doing, you know, like, you know, not to diminish bike the night, but we haven't even done one yet. And uh, we're already talking about next year. <laughs> um, and whereas Living Green is constantly doing these events like Tread Lightly, like the tree planting events, all these things. The, um, and then the, again, the public education ones that we're putting together. Um, like I'd love to see Harvest Share figure out how the city can adopt it as being the city's program. You know, it's a little bit like what I said with the history of Living Green uh, being a little bit of the one that sort of starts something and then when it's proven, you can see how it can work and how it can be a big benefit, then the city takes it on like Spring Into Clean and all of the other programs. So again, I, I don't know if, um, if uh, Living Green's events are ones that could be supported through a city ask through this committee, if that's something that this committee at this point thinks uh, that uh, that is worthwhile, or is that too self-serving to even put that out there? I'm just I'm just saying we're sort of already doing a lot of these things without any support, and uh, you know can obviously do them a lot better with support. No, ab absolutely. That's um, that's a really good point, and I think that's kind of possible with um, the framing here we have around the budget for the committee activities. Like it would be the the good thing about the committee actually having its own budget is that the committee has a say over how that budget gets spent rather than city council having a say over how that budget gets spent. So we're kind of re removing uh, a, a layer of um, uh, political uh, advocacy that needs to happen uh, by just having this committee advocate for a budget for itself and then it can have the flexibility to work with groups on events, outreach and promotion like working with Living Green on Tread Lightly or whatever the future committee um, feels would be best. Um, but I think that's the intention here is to provide that flexibility with that budget um, that we don't currently have where we have, to, like right now the approach would be going with an individual motion up through city council for each thing we want to spend money on. And we know how things that can turn out. It can be difficult. Uh, it's an extra layer of approval. Um, but then with this budget, we could kind of streamline it. Um, Wilf, did you have something to add on that piece? Yeah, I, I, mostly just to support Andy's comment that, uh, you know, I think we, we should be bringing recommendations to council more often to support um, Living Green and, and other initiatives like this. Um, I think it'd be very difficult for us to tag what those budget asks would be in advance. And that's why I was trying to differentiate between is this a budget for the uh, committee to operate or is it a budget to support initiatives the committee might bring forward? And if it's initiatives, um, frankly, we're going to need an awful lot more money than $2,500, particularly once we do a dive into the climate change initiatives that uh, were recommended earlier this year. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, you, you and I have spoken about this before, Key, and I think I brought it up at uh, at one of the meetings that um, I, I'd love to see us have a, a sort of a work plan and a schedule where we more regularly uh, work with staff to bring recommendations to council to say, uh, you know, to talk about things like what Andy's working on, what other uh, other initiatives initiatives we'd like to see happen in the city um, and ask council to support that and ask for, you know, have a specific ask for a budget to uh, to back those recommendations. So, you know, it, it seems to me like there's there's two budgets we're talking about. What One is ad hoc for specific initiatives like Andy's and Living Green, and the other is for, for this uh, committee to operate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure if there's any actual costs we have identified to the committee just operate and besides like right now the committee is the one taking the lead on bike the night and that's why we kind of identified bike the night as a need for the budget for this committee um but I, I, beyond that i'm not sure if we we know if there are any other costs that this committee would have uh, besides for specific initiatives like you've mentioned well which yeah. do we want to keep doing that on basis or I, I don't know how you do it otherwise, to be honest, since, except for, you know, having this budget for the committee and then allowing the committee to 
flexibly decide how to spend it. Um, I saw Eric's hand and then Kelly is up after. Eric, you're still on mute, not sure. Uh, you came off mute for half a second and then went back on. There you go. There we go. My computer's on lag here. Um, <laughs> I think definitely uh, part of the pitch to council of having an, uh, a certain amount of ad hoc budget is it would reduce uh, a lot of basically unnecessary time spent by council if we have to submit a small expense proposal to them for them to vote on uh, piecemeal, like each, each one at a time. And in fact, sometimes we have to do that through a committee of council even before it goes to council. And, um, so I think that it's in council's interest to reduce the the time cost of having to um, debate debate and vote on each of those things. So I think that could be definitely part of the pitch uh, to have this. And then the corollary would be we would have an annual report on on how the funding was used, um, and then council could then you know vote to accept that report and basically show that we're we're not frittering away the the funding. Um, but I think it would streamline uh, the process. And I think that's part of the value of doing this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Kelly? Okay, so if I was to look at this from above and, and I would say, this is the uh, Active Transportation Sustainability Advisory Committee. This committee is formed based on we have a outline, I believe this committee was created in 2018. And I believe there is a outline um, describing what the committee is and does. I think for it to, then I don't believe it included, and, and I had this conversation with Sherry briefly uh, about, I don't believe it included um, promotion events activities at the time, or it wasn't very specific to that. I'm wondering if um, the actual, description or of this particular committee needs to change uh, to include um, specific items or would it still be an advisory committee? Um, which kind of means to me just making recommendations, not actually action plans or doing anything. Um, so perhaps that's something that needs to be revised is you know, whether it's the name of the committee um, and or what the actions are that the committee is required to do. Um, I think that's important because the council is changing again, um, come the new council. So if, if this committee wants to make a recommendation to actually have the established guideline for the committee to change, then that might be a really good opportunity. Um, the other point, too, when I looked at the Excel sheet and I looked from 2018 up till now, we haven't had a lot of action <laughs> on, our, on our recommendations. That's disappointing. Um, so if I was to uh, you know, evaluate the committee and it's, 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 and it's nothing about the committee, I, I, all I'm looking at is what has been done at making these recommendations and not a lot has. So things are still in limbo. So is that what we wanna kind of continue doing for the next four years? We don't, we, we want to somehow um, look at how we get things done. And, and I, I'm not sure if things, um, that, that's just my view of it. So I think from a structural, we can have this conversation about what we'd like, but structurally, I think it needs to come back to whether it's you know, the recommendation on what this really means and how more effectively um, we can be. Because if we're honestly just giving lip service to, you know, we're making all these recommendations and they're kind of going into a black hole and nothing really comes back and, and there's no thing that happens, you know, what, what, what could we do better, I guess? Mm -hmm. Those are some really important points. I, uh, so just so we're all on the same page, like the mandate for the committee is to provide advice and perspectives associated with policies, programs, and facilities while promoting the following, a safe, convenient, sustainable, and accessible active transportation system and a sustainable, efficient, healthy, and resilient environment and community. Um, 
So it's pretty high level, pretty broad, um, you know, providing advice and perspectives on policies, programs, and facilities, and promoting. Uh, so very broad. I mean, that's a discussion we can have around recommendations to the committee if we, you know, want to narrow the focus, broaden the focus, or change it. I, I, I don't know. But um, I, th I think you raise a really important point around, you know, follow through on our um, recommendations to council. Um, and that was kind of my thinking with, you know, focusing on the plans and strategies that have been approved and how do we actually implement them and get the funding to implement them. Because it comes down to funding. Um, City Council over the past, you know, couple of decades has taken a low tax approach. And so, you know, staff are competing for resources and um, are doing a lot of these things off the side of their desk. And so, um, it's hard to keep up with all the recommendations from these committees when we ask for a new report and just because they're struggling to keep up with the basic uh, operating services at, for, for our residents um, because of the low um, property tax uh, numbers that we've set. Um, so I, I, I don't know, uh, you know, if that, I don't know if you want to add anything else, Kelly, on that or any specific suggestions on the transition document for what we can include, but. Yeah, yeah it, it, it is a very broad description of what this committee does. Um, you know, it'd be great if, if this was an actionable educational committee that had some kind of specific mandate every year to um, implement education for residents. But, you know, as Andy said, that's exactly what they do too, right? So is there a coordination that can happen? I, I just see, you know, for us to work more efficiently and effectively, to have specific directives and some money tied to it. It'd be so great if we advocate for the greenhouse gas reduction plan that doesn't have any money attached to it. <laughs> yeah, we need money to make things happen, guys. You know, we can't, we can't just, you know, say we're going to do stuff and not attach any funds to it. So yeah, that's really important. And we should definitely advocate for that. But in the meantime, you know, are there smaller little things that, um, you know, this committee can be actionable on uh, as it, as it, you know, moves forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that comes down to us being an advisory committee too, right? Like, you know, we're we're about giving advice and not necessarily about uh, getting down to action. Um, that's where the paid city staff come in, and city council setting the budget to be able to enable the paid city staff to be able to implement those actions. Um, I, I have Anne Marie next, uh, and then Andy, and then Laurel. A couple of thoughts, knowing that we can't really influence too much into the next term, right? We're kind of giving them some guidelines. Uh, and in that thought, it is if we can at minimum say you're going to want $2,500 um, to do bike the night and or figure out a sustainability plan. And wouldn't it be great if maybe the city looked at that, that and said, we can take this on as an event with BIA and others, and it actually becomes an annual city event. It's not based on the will of a committee or members of a committee uh, that change over over every four years or around asking for dollars. And, and they've got a sponsorship arm uh, and initiative now where the city can look at other opportunities too. My other um, thoughts just from the conversation are, um, if I think of it from an equity lens, um, we have arts and culture grants. We now have a $300,000 sport and rec grant that was fully utilized. Wouldn't it be great if this committee maybe made a recommendation that we also look at who is not supported through that grant? So I'm trying to be careful about Living Green having a formal position here and, and any optics around, you have a seat at the table so you've got access to dollars that others don't. So how do we roll this out to say, where do we create a more equitable situation if we feel it's not around grants that we support uh, and fund and those that actually can't find themselves in it. So hypothetically, Living Green, Urban Pantry, other community charitable not-for-profits that don't actually have access to the same type of municipal grants that others do. So I would kind of look at that as an area of question for this committee to say, how is the city going to balance opportunities for uh, initiatives that tie to sustainability, climate action, um, and active transportation that don't necessarily have a place in other grants. And 
and calling maybe for the city to look at something um, so we don't have have and have nots just by process. Um, and then like lastly from that, I think that creates an avenue that allows Living Green and any others to kind of have access to funds outside of initiatives that we might as an advisory board say, this makes sense, like from a um, alignment of initiatives, this makes sense. How are we supporting it? How are we partnering with um, agencies in our community to formally support this and maybe being a bit more direct there? And then I guess lastly, so we're not operating in a vacuum. I mean, if we're going to plan out the next four years for the next committee, you know, wouldn't it be great if staff came to the table to that committee in the beginning and said, this is where the climate adaptation strategy is going to go over the next four years. This is what we need for, from you to support us from a resident engagement activation and um, to be an educated voice, champion voice around these things and how can you help? And so how do we, if we think about active transportation, uh, adaptation and then kind of the climate emergency, how do we have line of sight over the next four years around where staff have a budget and have been empowered in, in their role and scope to move things forward? And then how are they helping to come to the table and basically saying, this is where you have a mandate and this is where you can have a real impactful role. Mm -hmm. And then we can kind of stay focused around how do we build momentum for some things at a resident level of change? Uh, and or when there's an intake budget being asked, a real appreciation going to council to say, you need to be paying attention to this because it has a relationship to the strategy. Don't look at it as a one page itemized list uh, of uh, maybe a part position or you know, a consultant for something, but it actually has, uh, you know, to not fund it, you need to understand the ramifications and make a more informed decision. Yeah, because sometimes I, I, the threads just aren't connected, right? To ask versus strategy. Mm -hmm. Definitely, that's it. That's a really good point. Um, so I'm making some notes here uh, to add some stuff in around that. Um, I think that's a great suggestion to have, like that happen at the beginning of the the term too. Like the key staff people for each of these strategies coming in, you know, sort of giving, you know, here's where we're at. Here's where our plan is over the next yeah. four years of your term. Um, and then maybe specifically on budget, like, can they speak specifically to what new budget resources in 2023, 2024, 2025 yeah. are supporting these plans? Yeah. Um, and if those resources aren't there, then the committee needs to think about providing advice uh, to council that those resources get put in. there. Yeah, even, yeah, just, yeah, ideally if staff can say, this is how you can help me. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I know sometimes we try to get that answer from staff and, you know, you got to walk a fine line. It's like ultimately council's the one who's directing them, but uh, yeah, we're, we're here to, to back them up too. Um, okay. Uh, Andy, you're up next. Um, Amory covered a lot of the, what I was going to uh, chime in with, with the, um, because I think this is one of the more important discussions we've had since I've come on anyway, is like, what is this committee's role? Is it about advice? Like, are we, and who are we advising? Are we just advising other councillor members that aren't on this committee? Or is it trying to work with staff? And I think setting that for the next one is gonna be really important. I think putting this together, Keenan, good idea, great initiative, um, because I know for, even though, you know, Living Green, we came in, Eric was on our committee, um, our board of directors, and so he was sort of advising us a bit, but then he stepped off our board of directors. So then Living Green got their formal role. I don't think you heard from me from the first probably three to four meetings. And now you can't shut me up. Um, but uh, because there's a transition period, like not, none of us were going to walk into this and have blunt, guns a blazing. I know what was all about. And I think uh, to get the committee to be a lot more effective for this next term, it should be very clearly mandated. This is what we do. And you're going to be able to get people not waiting four months for meetings before they can chime in because now you know, oh, 
that's what this is and that's what we're supposed to be doing. So again, kudos you for uh, for trying to take a stab at this. And I, I don't know if we're going to get to it today, but getting that, uh, are we an advisory committee or are we an action committee? I think it was like, again, um, I love how it's kind of coming out in almost an organic way with this bike the night, like suddenly this committee is coming up with an event. And this committee didn't have a formal um, budget for it or um, one, at least one that was accessible um, and or, um, you know, like even like the like who's taking the lead on that. Like so Living Green stepped in to do it uh, because we know that that is something that we do. We do events. But I think that getting that terms of reference down so we know exactly what we do and what we don't do absolutely vital um, to the success and, and making sure as Kelly points out, we're not just talking into our little echo chamber and not actually making those actions. Cause this is a lot of um, expertise, a lot of big brains around the table, a lot of years of experience. Um, and uh, you know, we, we definitely could be a little bit more effective in what we're, what we're trying to do. So yeah. I'll leave it there. No, absolutely. Great, great points, important points. And I, I think the next term of the committee will have the benefit of it not being the first term of a new committee. Uh, I think, um, you know, we had a, a different chair at the beginning of the committee, uh, this committee's term, we've had a lot of changeover in membership, and it was a brand new committee. Um, that was sort of just two separate groups smushed together, and not much direction on, on um, how to achieve our goals. So um, yeah, I think it's good that we're, we're sort of having this reflection time on, you know, what worked and what didn't over the past term and, and that advice to the new term. Um, Laurel, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was going to say something else when I first brought my hand, but now <laughs> there's been so much discussion. <laughs> Anyways, I, the only thing I was, I can add now at this point, I think is that um, I think the things that you put in your PowerPoint are measurable items, um, which I think is important uh, to do that distinction. So there's like everybody, clearly we've got our hands in a lot of different pots here, but prior, like the priority handover document, I think it makes sense that it would, it would be the measurable things. So, you know, ongoing input into the greenhouse gas plan, uh, you know, a, a target to, have a cycle, cyclable city, you know, those are things that um, we can work towards and try to push towards that are measurable, which I think is sometimes it helps to prioritize um, all these different ideas. But anyway, there's a lot to do here, I think, as far as the overall mandate goes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's the, the advantage of having all these plans and strategies. Like we've the city has contracted consultants and had their mm -hmm. expert internal experts, you know, do months and months of work with stakeholders on all these plans and strategies and they have timelines and actions within those mm -hmm. plans and strategies. And um, I think we could get a long way, um, go a long way as a committee, just advocating for resources to back up those and providing advice on how best to implement those uh, plans and strategies. Um, okay. Any, any other thoughts right now? Should I go back to the presentation maybe and do the last couple of slides? And I've made some good notes here, some good feedback. Um, just quickly, I think we are working with um, the structure of the committee itself, the legislative structure of the city itself. Like the advisory committee is kind of the structure that exists for engaging citizens in the legislative process at the municipal level. Um, there, as far as I know, there isn't another formal type of body that really does that. And it's all about that advisory capacity um, for pretty much every other committee. Although I guess some of them do provide, like do do events and the International Relations Committee sort of does run some uh, programming as well. And they have a budget attached to do that. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, we'll have a hard time sort of moving away from that advisory committee structure because uh, that is sort of our key role, our, our core role. Um, and I think emphasizing that to the new committee and sort of providing those opportunities 
to provide advice in a way that's going to make the biggest impact is is probably the right path forward. Any any other thoughts on the mandate piece on how we should approach that or any other suggestions? Maybe just a quick comment in case we run out of time because I think we're yeah. close. Um, do right. you want feedback to you? Uh, if we can circulate the deck and maybe just uh, other thoughts. But on structure, I mean, my quick one is, what about two co-chairs? If we've got individuals that are really passionate about active transportation versus sustainability and climate action, maybe we've got two different, you know, um, thought leaders that can support rounding out the agenda and or splitting time or every other month it's a different topic and we actually know what we're getting into at a deeper level um, and can spend some time on it so maybe it's just a recommendation around how do you balance two um, you know uh, mandates so people know you know am I going to get the value added of the meetings and what to expect on the agenda and how it can be equitable between those two uh, important aspects. I love that suggestion. Um, I, I like the idea of doing every other meeting. I don't know how other people feel about that. And, and I like the co-chair suggestion too. I think that's great. Um, do we feel comfortable putting that as a, a recommendation to the new term? That we do I so move things? that. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's a great way of, of um, sort of formally building that infrastructure, the concern that Will has raised a couple, a couple times yeah. now. I think just from conversation, not that it has been great, but when we have a presentation, we can really dig into kind of other pieces that relate to it in that same thread and not feel like we're just moving to maybe a completely different agenda item that shifts us into a whole different thinking. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here, quickly, I'll go through the last three slides. There's only three more slides. Um, and then I'll, I'll share them around with the committee too. Um, and then um, go from there. Uh, all right, can everyone see that? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the next one was around the uh, city's circular economy framework. Um, I wanna do some more work on this slide to sort of uh, parse out um, exactly where the committee can focus its effort on advocacy and advice um, to city council on the circular economy. Um, it's kind of a starting point for that. Um, and then I've got the climate change adaptation strategy. Um, and I put in here advocating for funding and specifically requesting an update on the implementation plan because there are actions within the implementation plan um, with timelines um, that have just kind of been left behind um, and not funded uh, and not resourced. So um, I think uh, a formal update from staff to this committee at the beginning of the next term about you know, here's the things we have completed in the implementation plan, here's the things that haven't, um, then we can start advocating for that funding. Uh, anything on this piece? This is me being Am picky. I, I just move it up to the, be the second slide. So yeah. there's a relationship to it. It's not forgotten about, like, or disconnected. No, I think that's a great, great suggestion. Although I might keep Cycle Barry is second, and then this is third. Is that okay? Yeah, so we're balancing sustainability and active transportation. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, and, point, um, yeah. If you don't mind, uh, where does, um, because we seem for some reason to have separated um, climate adaptation and climate mitigation in our city. And, and we have two separate groups working on this, um, and I'm not sure why. Um, but uh, is so the climate change adaptation strategy is that is there a separate climate change mitigation strategy? Yes, there is. Uh, it, that's the greenhouse gas community energy greenhouse gas reduction plan is the climate mitigation strategy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and Andy. Then, and then uh, and then the urban forest strategy should maybe be acknowledged as well. Mm. Uh, that hasn't been updated in a lot of years and it also sets some things that the city was going to do by a certain time that's a great point and early on in this the term of this committee we we did have a presentation on the urban forest st strategy and provided a recommendation to council that i think was one of our recommendations that just went out into the ether and nothing happened. Um, so no, that's a really, really good point. Um, do you think having a separate slide on the urban forestry strategy would be appropriate? How do people feel about that? Andy, do you have thoughts on that? Possibly, but I mean, it really, yeah. I mean, it, when they started the, um, 
the urban forest strategy, I don't think that they had got the out of the climate change stuff in there, but I'm, I'm not sure, and I actually should look into this, have they linked the two? Like yeah. to me, it seems like they, when you're talking about green infrastructure and adaptation and mitigation, the urban forest strategy is an integral part of that. So I'm not sure if there's been any formal um, auto adaptation or adoption of, of synthesizing those strategies together. Yeah, I'll take another look at the adaptation plan because, you know, it could, they could be pretty closely linked. Um, Will? Um, Keenan, you just said something which um, just, I'm, I'm going to just ask a question. Um, you said okay. um, some of the recommendations have just sort of vanished into the ether. And that, thought, that, that theme has come up a couple of times during this call. And so I would just kind of ask ourselves a question on how do we gain more uh, credibility um, working with staff and with council so that when we make recommendations, um, we're recognized as a committee that has uh, engaged the community, engaged staff, and um, that our recommendations are important and meaningful and uh, need to be acted on. Uh, I'm not sure the answer to that at all. I think you and Anne-Marie would have a much better insight on, on how we accomplish that, but I think that might be an important challenge for the committee moving forward to um, to just raise um, raise our profile and credibility to uh, so our recommendations are turn into action. Mm -hmm. uh, Anne Marie, did uh, you have some thoughts? Well, on that? I'm wondering if it's just a broader conversation around how we follow the bouncing ball for how recommendations move through reference committee, then to council, and then outcomes, and so. Sometimes even the reporting app um, gets consolidated within minutes of, of committees um, and then taken for information, but no action. So I think my, it's probably maybe a, a broader piece, even back to the legislative and court services about how recommendations actually loop back to the committee uh, as a report, either through city staff, like through support staff um, and or through representatives, but some type of of tracking so we can identify what what meetings they actually landed on uh, and then what happened if, if it was just taken for information or was something actually moving that we can we want to be mindful of keeping on our agenda. Mm -hmm. Perhaps there's a room here for like a, a whole slide or a whole section of the, this final document where we talk about you know follow through on recommendations and how we achieve that. Um, and, and you know, maybe recommending to the new committee, they work with legislative and court services at the beginning to ensure that every recommendation gets tracked and followed back to the committee itself. Um, maybe working to refine our the motions that the new committee, the new term passes to provide uh, deadlines or, uh, you know, they can work with staff to try to find a deadline that'll work uh, so that we're keeping track of when it comes back. Uh, Brett, I see your hand is up. So I don't know if you have uh, some thoughts on this piece. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to give an update. I know we're not going to get to it through this uh, meeting today, but just wanted to note to committee members, the recommendation pending list isn't as negative as it looks. I did a quick review on the active transportation transportation items, and the majority of them are addressed. And I think there's just maybe an information breakdown getting back to you. Uh, I can't speak to our park staff. They're on vacation today, but I think this will work out well for the next meeting. They'll be able to fill in that data. And I'm, I'm hoping that they'll be in the same position I am as well. So it's not what's presented. I think it's much better shape than what's uh, what's there. So thank you. Oh, thanks, thanks, Brett. We appreciate that. Um, okay. Uh, anything else on this adaptation slide? For now, I've got some good feedback on that. Okay. Um, and then I have this specific uh, initiative in here too, um, Sherry. Uh, had mentioned this at a previous meeting when we were talking about the transition document. Um, and I, I think it's, you know, there's a lot of structure in place here um, already that we could support. I'm not really exactly sure what our role can be um, on this initiative. So I'm open to thoughts on that. Um, but I- Yeah, I a September like meeting, right? Maybe it would be topical to put it on the agenda because we we've got meetings happening at a steering committee level before that and then as Justin was sharing some movement on that before back to school. So perhaps if Sherry's uh, available or Sarah, we could, um, and members of that committee might be able to kind of talk a bit about where that um, committee conversation 
leaves off on August the 9th. And if there's anything that we want to include into the next term of this committee's work plan. Yeah, uh, I think that's a great time for a discussion, a deeper discussion on this. Okay, uh, I realize we're six minutes over. Um, so um, I don't want to keep all of you, but um, I'll send around those slides. Um, we did kind of, like a lot of these items we didn't get to on the agenda kind of fit into uh, each other, our similar conversation about you know the future of this committee. Um, on the committee name change, just quickly, I, I don't know if people have quick thoughts on that or if wanted to send an email with quick thoughts, um, but I think it's an interesting idea. Um, I just don't know if people feel good about that. Uh, Emery? I guess my quick thoughts are leave it to the next term of the committee. Um, rather than, you know, a couple of months before they resume that mandate, we've made a decision that they may or may not be aligned with, but might just fall into them reviewing their terms of reference, resetting that and just saying, you know, consider it, see what yeah. you think. I mean, I, I don't feel passionate about one way over the other. I think it's more about the structure of how we balance a conversation and target some initiatives a bit more specifically. Kelly? Just yeah, that was me putting that up there. Um, I, I like climate action because it's action. So it, it, it would just, that's all. It was like yeah. sustainability. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> I mean, a whole lot of things, but it, you know, if we, part of the action, and I really like Anne-Marie's idea. It's like, okay, well, we've got funding for arts and we've got funding for sports. We need funding for climate action. And, and perhaps that's something that could align with the committee, you know, if we had that, you know, grant opportunity for climate action for our working groups in Barrie, just, it, it, mm -hmm. I, I, I think I agree. We'll let the next committee decide, but I, but I'm advocating for climate action. <laughs> I wish we had a snappier name, to be honest. It's just too long. It's just too hard to say. <laughs> um, okay. Um, any other thoughts, burning thoughts that you want to share here in the meeting, recognizing we are a little over time, but like, if you really feel like you want to say something about the transition document now, feel free. Um, Eric? Um, can I seriously make a motion that we um, look at having co-chairs covering the two uh, main themes and also if possible have alternating meetings? Um, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, do we want to motion that formally and change the structure or do we, because I was thinking we'd put that in the transition document as a recommendation to the new term, but uh, if we want to formally change that before the new term, I'm open to that idea as well. Um, I saw Emery on mute and then I, I think oh. Will had his hands up. But. I'm supportive of it. I think it can still... I think it can still move because it's within our operations and it goes for information to council, right? So I think we're still able to, to make that change if we want to uh, and have them try it out based on our learnings. Yeah. So we I could, support that. Area. We could try it through the fall. That's it. That's a good idea. Yeah. How yeah many operate with it. September, October, November, three meetings. That's an interesting idea. Uh, Andy, did you have some thoughts on that? And then, uh, uh, Will, I don't know if you still have uh, your hand up there. No, okay. Sorry, my hand was up about something else if we were okay. ending, uh, not about that point. Okay. Um, hmm. Do So do we wanna just try it as a sort of a pilot for the fall uh, and do like maybe the September meeting on sustainability or climate action and then the October meeting on active transportation, see how that goes and we'll have a different chair for each. Uh, October that... fits well, because we'll be coming out of bike the night and back to school. So I would say October would fit from an active transportation. What if we hash out the terms at the September meeting and sort of figure out uh, the logistics of what we want to try and then and do it for October or November? I like that too, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we need to pick a co-chair and, and which meetings and, and sort of set a slightly different agenda format. So there'll be a bit of discussion around that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So if we leave that to the September meeting and yeah, we could do a quick trial run and let the new term know how it went. Like Everyone it. good with that approach? Yeah. All right. Since we're not making any formal changes right now, it sounds like 
we're good. We've got consensus, or mostly at least. Um, okay, Andy, did you have something else to add? I did, yeah. So one point of clarification, which was I had given you some false information uh, about the amount of people who registered for Bike the Night. It's actually uh, only 83 that have registered through the Eventbrite, but it's a much higher number of Facebook people who said they're going. So I wanted to clarify that. I mean, 83 is a lot, so don't say a lot. But it, yeah, yeah <laughs> no, it wasn't the 150 that I said, so I don't know where I was okay. getting that one from. Uh, and then the final one I wanted to point out is I've just found out about this. Um, the Rotary Club of Barry is hosting um, Bob McDonald, host of Quirks and Corks, to do a, an event on Tuesday, September 20 at Georgian College Theatre, um, all about um, climate action. So I don't know if they've started to actively promote this yet, but like, I, again, I've, it's just come across my desk uh, recently, but this seems like something. And I think this is something that they had planned for Earth Day, but it got canceled because of COVID. And so I think they, this is a reschedule. So I'm just pointing it out right now because I think it's a value to this community. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Awesome. And then um, can I quickly, I'm going to send the link around, but can September, can we make time if it fits? Um, around other kind of new initiatives. So we're getting some feedback soon from Kimmies and Bloom, but um, one of the judges already had an impression that we would probably do very well around applying for Green Canada's, um, um, or the Green, Community, Green Canadian Communities Grant or competition uh, based on some of the progress staff have made um, across different departments and what was showcased during that. So Maybe we'll have some feedback at that time, but I wouldn't want to lose sight on it because it might be something that falls more formally under this mandate. Yeah, sure. So sorry, that's uh, an agenda item in September for... If I can just share a little bit about Green Communities, Green communities. Um, and okay. then see if anyone's familiar and I'll point to links, but five minutes. Perfect. Okay. Sounds good. Um, and if there uh, are any other agenda items for the September meeting, um, let Brandy and I know. Uh, Anything else anyone wanted to say before we adjourn the meeting? Sorry for keeping you late. Everyone good? Okay, that's great. Thanks so much, uh, Brandy. Thanks, uh, Brett and Justin for being here. Thanks to all the committee members. Um, and I will circulate those slides uh, after I make a few changes based on the discussion today um, and solicit your feedback. Um, Brandy, anything else you need from us before we adjourn? Or no, not that I can think of off the top of my head, although I know how to get a hold of everybody. So. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And with that, we will adjourn the meeting. Thanks so much, everyone, and yeah. take care, and hope you continue to enjoy the summer.